Hello and welcome Hello. to the show. Uh, I'm your host, Joe, and uh, today I'm joined by Neil Atkinson, Philip Smallwood, and Emma Sanders. How are we all? Excellent. Yeah, good. Oh, thank thank you. you. Good, good. So, uh, so it's been a, it's been a good month for the the Reds so far, hasn't it? We've um, played three games, two in the league, one in, one in the cup, undefeated. So, you know, as we, you know, we were a bit more frustrated probably in the last show, Neil. So, I think it's been, it's been a really good month for the for the, uh, the club. It's been an excellent month. I think that the, the Villa game in general shows that the club can can hang in. Let's be clear, Villa made changes, but then so did Liverpool. So I think having that sort of the awareness of that, I think is 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 a good thing that this is a squad that can exist on that plane uh, where it is along the side of the, the, the you know the Super League sides. So I think that that's no bad thing. Uh, you know they get what they deserve out of the match. It's they also you know I mean it's a lovely penalty shootout. It really is, but it wasn't a good game. You know it, it wasn't a game that was packed full of incidents or anything like that. But ultimately, you know Liverpool getting the results on the penalty shootouts just sort of backs up, buttresses the draw that they get o- over the course of the game. And I think it's important for the club to feel as much as possible as though they, when they do go into the WSL that we very much hope they do at the end of the campaign, they're doing so on a on a stronger foot as possible. And I think a Conte Cup run can only help with that. The big thing that I thought was the control shown in the game against Sheffield United. I thought it was obviously, as, as a lot of football matches are, it's a game that's defined by one side sticking the ball in the back of the net early. But Liverpool just absolutely keep Sheffield United at arm's length for the entirety of the match. You know, Wardlaw scores, and then it's entirely Liverpool's game, I would say. Yes, there's a bit of push from Sheffield United towards the end of the match around uh, around set pieces predominantly, but Liverpool have sort of got that under control. And if anything, you know, they should certainly make it three before half time. But there's a couple of breaks where they could go make it three, but they don't need to. And I think that that's for me, that's a sign of real progress. You know, it's it, to me, it's the most the side has looked in control of a match at this level that we've seen full stop. So if that continues, then it bodes really, really well. I know we're going to get on to it, but this this show for me is very much about what happens next because you do feel as though the next run of games will be season-defining, not least because of the fact that, as we always come back to, it's only 22 league games. So what happens in this next run is absolutely massive, but Liverpool couldn't be going into it in any better shape, not just in terms of the results, but in terms of the control they've had over the games that they've played. Excellent, excellent. So, for those of you who haven't seen the results, um, we played Coventry, uh, beat them 2-0. Uh, Coventry went down to 10 quite early in the game, but I don't let that take away from the game. Liverpool were dominant uh, and made changes again. Uh, Sheffield United, uh, Emma, this could have been a bit of a banana skin because it's ex-Liverpool manager, quite a few ex-Liverpool players. It's at Bramall Lane, 4,000 uh, pe- people at Bramall Lane, which I think is the biggest crowd they've had for a women's game. So, it's all set up there for a bit of a hallmark of a, a banana skin, which possibly in the past we haven't sort of rose the occasion, but it seems to be the bigger the occasion, uh, the bigger the performance. Yeah, I remember saying to Neil, actually, that I thought it was a strange decision, actually, from Sheffield to to have that game um, at Bramall Lane. Obviously, I, I understand it was a good opportunity for them to, to get kind of record attendances in, but in terms of like the actual playing conditions and the pitch itself, I think that only suited Liverpool. And one thing that they they certainly struggled with last season that they're getting to grips a bit more this season was was obviously the the types of pitches that they were playing on in the championship as opposed to the WSL. You know that the three G turfs and the kind of um, the pitches that are a little bit um, dirty and not not quite up to scratch. So um, actually playing on quite a clean um, you know smooth pitch, I think really suited Liverpool's way of play. And um, yeah, as as Neil says, I think. From start to finish, really, you never really felt like Liverpool were, were going to let that league go. Um, Sheffield United have been a team that have always been kind of up there and causing uh, mischief, really, at the top of the table. And they they have been a really tough side to beat. Um, they were under Carla Ward and they now are un, under Neil Redfern. So I think coming through that game, as Neil said, I think showed um, real pedigree in, in terms of the composure um, from Liverpool and, and that will only put them in good stead going into what I think will be the biggest game of the season against Durham away um, in mid- mid-November which is coming up in this next run of games mm, Definitely um, Philip and then we had the uh, we had the game against Villa, uh, so for people who don't know the Conte Cup, it's a, a league format so uh, top t- uh, if you've top of your group you go through and then it's the best second place finish size, the nice quirk of the Conte Cup is even if you draw it's straight to a penalty shootout to get a bonus point 
So it basically every makes every game matter, you know. So it does have that bit of excitement. Uh, Neil, please know my bad language on my daughter was actually quite good this time. Uh, <laughs> apart, apart, apart from the penalty shootout, I got very excited with that in a positive way, though. So that was good fun. So, but I mean, apart from probably a sucker punch opening goal, Philippa, Liverpool reacted really well. Uh, and we've seen in the past, normally we can see the sucker punch in previous seasons, that's really held us back. But the reaction was really good. And the pleasing thing was. As Neil said, it's probably, I think, from the Sheffield game, I think it was like nine, ten changes. And the, the side didn't look any weaker, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I was I was really nervous going into that game because, like Neil said, it's it's kind of like a little bit of a mark that if we do, you know, manage to get promoted this season, you know, can we can we make a mark in that league? Um, and Aston Villa had had a really good start to the season as well. Um, you know, they got some really good results and we're... I think they were third in the league uh, when we actually played them. Um, so I I was really nervous, especially when I saw the changes that had been made. I did expect him to make quite a few changes for the game, um, just because you know the the league is what is math is what matters to us. Um, and you know we, sometimes you can lose that rhythm. Um, and I think what impressed me most was the fact that players that came into the side um, looked like they they been playing you know all season really um you know we we kind of lacked just for me that killer instinct up front um and we saw that when leanne kernan came onto the pitch you know she came on basically got the goal then got injured and went back off again but she did the business for us and um you know she's somebody who for me has really stepped up in the last few games and, and has really found her feet in this league and you know i've been really impressed with her um but yeah, for the for the side not to panic as well, I think that's the thing. Um, like last season, you know, we would go a goal behind, and you would see that the the players kind of like would would start to panic a little bit, um, and then, you know, they would then struggle to get composed again and get back into the into the game. So that was really pleasing for me. Um, and I think, you know, for me, I felt we were the better side in that game. Um, I know Villa have quite a bit of quality, but. I did still think that we had the edge and I was I was really pleased that we managed to get that bonus point because I think out of the two sides, we were the ones that, that they deserved it. So um, really good penalties as well, um, you know, which is always good to see because, um, it's you know, if we get penalties in games, you'd like to feel confident that we can take them as well. It was, yeah. So probably a couple of the unlikely penalty takers. I mean, I don't know how many penalties I've seen Jade Bailey take. I definitely don't think Liam Robes ever took a penalty before. Uh, but to be fair, they all, they all buried them. And it was quite poetic that the record appearance holder, Ash, gets the uh, the, the decisive winning penalty. But I Can, mean, can first... we talk about how Leanne took her penalty as well? It was you, like... It was... Honestly. It was like, you know, you know, when you watch Mo Salah and you think he's going to miss it every single time, even though he scores all the time. And like when, when Leanne stepped up to take it, I thought she's barely even running here. It was like she barely even moved and she just sort of like floundered up to it and just went like that and then absolutely smashed it. I was like, where, where did that come from? It completely, yeah, anyway, completely blew me away. Absolutely rifled into the roof of the net. I couldn't get over <laughs> it. Couldn't get over it. Absolutely. Like, it, was, it was still rising when it hits the net. Uh, it was absolutely still rising when it hits the roof of the net. It was incredible. And it was an incredible save as well. Yeah, yeah that's, that's worth yeah. pointing out. Yeah, yeah, Riley Foster again, you know, as we always see, when she gets an opportunity, she's really, really good. She's a you know excellent understudy to um uh, Laws. Rachel and Laws. that's the word I couldn't get the word <laughs> Rachel Laws. Uh to be honest, it also probably wrong she's she's definitely pushing Rachel Laws for who's playing. Uh, I mean, we do wish her well because sadly she she is in, uh, unfortunately injured at the moment. Um uh, so we're, I'm not sure how long she's out for, but you know, we hope she uh, uh, recovers soon because she is a very, very good goalkeeper. But in that spell, you know, who, the two players that stood out for me are probably probably Leanne Kiernan. I mean, she's four goals in three. This is a player that we, I think, probably the previous show said she was busy, she was hardworking, probably needed that goal, and she looks like a different player now. She's four in three. And Mel Lawley, where she played yeah. every game. She's the only one in the Villa game who wasn't rested, you know, which probably shows how crucial she is to us. She's just um, more end product and just looks the best player in the league at the moment. Yeah, I, yes. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I was was that was that for Philippa? Uh, anyone? anyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Leanne, Leanne was was going to be my shout. I know that Philippa just mentioned her then, um, but yeah, I, I think yeah, just her goals record alone. I think I think that tells you all, all you need to know. She was brought in as as a goal scorer and she stepped up to the plate and she's doing that. And like you say, Mel's 
Mal's shown a bit more consistency now. We, you know, she's always had the quality and that's always been, um, I know certainly me and Philippa have discussed this, but the, the frustrations of watching Mal Lawley, where you just know how good she can be. And um, she hasn't quite hit the consistency that, that you would have liked, but she's started to show that um, this season a lot more often than not. So that's really pleasing. But um, I know we spoke about her on the last show, but Leanne Rowe for me is still, she's still in, in, in fantastic form. So she's another player that, yeah, has stepped up to the plate for me. Cool. And Philippa, from your point of view, anyone else stood out apart from those two? Um, I think Taylor Hines again. Um, you know, she's she's pushing up really high on the left-hand side. You know, she got the goal um, against Coventry, I think it was. Um, you know, within the first minute, which set us on our way in that game. Um, you know, I just I just feel that that she's really supporting well down that left hand side. And um, you know, we mentioned Mel Lawley just before. For me, she's she's a player that's playing with a lot of confidence now. Um, and I think that makes a massive difference to her. Um, I spoke briefly to Matt Beard about it, and and he was saying she's definitely somebody who, when she's confident, you know, she can give a lot more to the side. And I think we're seeing that at the moment. Um, and long may it continue because with Mel Lawley in that sort of form. She causes so many problems for the opposition. It, it really does help us out a, a great deal. Definitely, definitely, I totally agree there. Uh, but Neil, um, sticking with the side, and the f- we, we briefly touched on it because uh, we saw it in the, la- the last game before our, our show. Is the manager switched to five three five two three, which is an unusual formation. But it's, I don't think it's the formation he wanted at the start of the season. But it's bringing out the best in probably a lot of players now. Yeah, I think it's interesting around, um, I think one of the things he's backing and is able to back is the energy of his centre midfielders. So the fact that he's got centre midfielders who, certainly by the standards of this level, are multifunctional and have got a ton of energy. So Kerry Holland is the, is the perfect sort of epitome of this. She absolutely gets around the pitch. She's an unbelievable athlete and she does it nonstop. She does it for the length of time that she's on the pitch. And I think that this is another thing that makes this formation interesting is that he's got five subs. And he's using them, and he's using them especially in the middle of the park. So what he's able to do is he's able to say, listen, we might be a player light because, you know, whilst in all the years I've been watching the women's game, you see a lot of 4-5-1, you see a lot of 4-2-3-1, you see a lot of overloaded centre midfield areas. And you don't see that many sort of back fives, but you see a lot of sides that play a, a sort of a variant on 4-3-3, 4-5-1, 4-2-3-1. what he's ended up with is gambling on, we can go one player light in there, and give ourselves greater agency down both the flanks and at the heart of the defence. But what that then turns into is, but I'll make subs there, and I'll change it there, and I'll put additional energy on there. And if you're only playing two centre midfielders and you're asking them to put it all in for 60, 70 minutes, it only takes two subs to replace those two centre midfielders, if you sort of see what I mean. So you're using up both of your subs, and almost every game, when you see, he's been taking off the two centre midfielders during the game. But within that, though, what he's got is he's got depth, in that position, therefore, especially when he's only playing two of them. But then the replacements who come on are also able to be pretty multifunctional themselves. So, you know, Bo Cairns can be an attacking midfielder, but she can just look after the ball in the middle of the park. Holland, as I say, is all action, tons and tons of energy. Rachel Furness has got many of these qualities as well, puts herself about absolutely brilliantly, uh, is able to overlo- help overload in wide areas and knows when to do that, is able to join in the front line, knows when to do that, and is able to screen the back four and knows when to do that. Jade Bailey's more sort of defensively minded, but she can more than play a little bit. So as you go through Carla Humphreys, we've talked about on a previous show with a passing range. You know, when you go through what he's actually got there, he's able to ensure that he can that he can keep the energy levels really, really high. But I think the player who's most important to that is Kerry Holland because I think she, he she is most the epitome of that sort of footballer who just simply does not stop working while she's on the pitch. Nothing seems to tire her out, and it's as much he's as much I think taking her off for her own protection as it is the idea that she necessarily needs refreshing at this point. Cool. Neil's just ruining the uh, my schedule here. We'll, we'll, we'll come sorry. back to Kerry. Sorry, we'll come back to Kerry Holland in a minute. Uh, Philippa, but uh, I mean, the other area does really help us is our is our well, they're not the fullbacks and the wingbacks um, in Charlotte Wardlaw, and we've already talked about Taylor Hines. I mean, if you haven't seen it, Charlotte Wardlaw's goal against Sheffield United, it's it's worth a watch. It's a hell of a hell of a finish, but it brings out their best assets, and they both can defend. Uh, but going forward, they are real assets. I mean, if there's a Charlotte, Charlotte Wardlow, she is keeping the Welsh international Raza Roberts out the side, which, to be fair, takes some doing. Yeah, absolutely. I was surprised that, um, you know, Raza hasn't been starting in games, to be honest. Um, and I felt early on Charlotte was a little bit um, 
Well, I mean, she's young, isn't she? She's inexperienced, so I felt like she she's kind of like grown into the position in a way. Um, she's she now knows her, her fellow uh, players uh, a lot better than she did when she first started with us. Um, but she loves a tackle for me, um, and she just gives us all energy down that right hand side, a bit like Taylor Hines on the left as well. You know, the pair of them you know, we're a great support up front. So it kind of gives us almost like five forwards at times, um, which I think really, really helps. As you know, last season, I felt we, we were a little bit light up top. We were kind of relying on two or three players to to basically do all our attacking. Um, and this season, we seem to, to be a bit more fluid with that. Um, you know, Neil just mentioned there about the midfielders and, you know, the pretty much two box to box midfielders that he's asking for in there to support everything. So both to support the back line and also to support the forwards. And I think, you know, it just gives us a lot more um control. We 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 determine where the play is going to be. Um and it allows the back line to also push up as well. I think a lot of the time last season there was far too many gaps between, you know, the midfield and the defense and the midfield and the forwards. And I think you know, this season we're a lot more of a compact team and we all seem to to push up together rather than or fall back together rather than it being just in two sections sort of. So, um, you know, it's just been really, really good to see. And, uh, you know, the two two wide players for me, um, Taylor Hines and, and Charlotte Wardlaw, have been a big part of, of why this system's <clears throat> working that he's playing at the moment. Definitely. Uh, uh, probably it's the first time in a couple of years we can actually talk about proper <laughs> strength and depth in multiple areas for Liverpool. Uh, I mean, the uh, Sheffield United manager, that was, a, that was a big thing he mentioned post-game is look at what Liverpool can bring off the bench and look at who they left on the bench who didn't even get a game. And it was kind of showing that's a level that, you know, we haven't seen for a while, which again is a, a positive side for the club is you are looking now go, you know, we, we lose a set, we lose a centre-back, you can bring in uh, Nee Fahey's playing or it's Michaela Moore. You know, th- there's a lot of places where you're going... You know we've got strength and depth there, and we have covered the uh, the loss of Rihanna Dean really well. With Leanne Kernan has now sort of stepped up, so you know that's another sort of big positive I think for them. Uh, so following off the feature we always do it is well I pick uh, three players. We we'll just have a bit of a talk around who the players are, just to get, give people a bit of an idea of uh, what they are, who they look like, you know, what type of players are if you haven't seen them play. So uh, the first player is going to be. Um, Taylor Hines, we've already we've mentioned her a few times, but she is the player of the moment at the moment. She's uh, just got herself back into the England squad. She's uh, England under twenty threes. Came from Everton and was I think she's been brilliant for us. Probably the only problem she had last year was it was we probably overplayed her a little bit last year. But this year, I think also this this formation is saving her legs a little bit. How do you feel, Emma? Yeah, I, I think I think when she joined from Everton, she was a player who was probably out of out of confidence. She hadn't really played much there, didn't really get much game time. Like you say, sort of dropped out of the uh, the international youth team a little bit. So I think she came to Liverpool hoping to kind of regain that confidence, and um, she's been given the game time, and she's just grown and grown um, throughout the last two seasons. I think um, we've seen her get fitter. I think in the summer as well, um, you can see physically like she's looking stronger, she's looking leaner, and. I think she's worked really hard in, in pre-season to um, to just be the absolute fittest that, that she can possibly possibly be because, like you say, like she, towards the end of last season, she was probably tiring a bit because she just wasn't used to playing that many games, I don't think. Um, and she was playing all the time. You know, she was, a, she was a key player for Liverpool last season. So I think this season she wanted to make sure that her form didn't tail off. And um, I, think, I think we're seeing that across the 90 minutes now because... As as Philippa was saying earlier, she's she's bombing up and down the pitch. She provides support for the for the attacking players. She's solid at the back. Um, I think she works really well um, as as a, as a wing back as opposed to a full back as well. Just because I think we get the best out of her. I think she has got a really good passing range as well. I like how quickly she punches the ball through to the attackers. I think in the past we've perhaps been a little bit slow in terms of getting the ball to our forward players, and that's something that I really like from Taylor. Is that you know she kind of looks for that for that crucial um, kind of cutting pass first as opposed to you know maybe playing the safer ball. Um, some people might not like that. Some people might prefer the safer ball, but I I, I like that from a wing back. Um, you know we see it on the men's side with, with Trent. We see how how quickly that can you know cut out you know three four five players in midfield, and I think Taylor does that really well for for the women's side. So um, yeah, big fan of hers. 
And uh, yeah, hopefully she can just keep up this form throughout the rest of the season because she is such a key player for Liverpool. Yeah, it's an interesting point you bring up about uh, the way she punches her passes through because, uh, Philippa, I sort of feel now Liverpool want to win the league. They want to get promoted. And I don't think you win a league playing safe football. I think you do have to take risks and do have yeah. to sort of push the push push it forward because there's plenty of teams in this league who will be quite happy to sit back and take a draw. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, in the past, um, we've kind of been a little bit too afraid of losing rather than um, wanting to win in a way. Um, and I think you can see that, that the players are hungry. Um, and I think this feeds into how how all the players are playing for me at the minute. They are always the first thought is, you know, how do we get the ball forward? You know, whereas in the past, you know, you would look and we'd be passing it around the back and just, you know, trying to keep hold of the ball rather than trying to to do something with it. And I think we've learned a lot that the best way to break these teams down in this league is to actually, you know, with the, the quicker passing, the more incisive passing, like Emma says, that uh, Taylor's been been doing this season. And I think, I think that is true. It's, you know, the way we scored the first goal against Coventry was exactly that, just getting down that left-hand side, uh, Mel Lawley looking to, you know, run down the wing and, and beat a couple of players and then passing it inside to Taylor Hines, who was supporting in the box. And, you know, catching teams on on the break, um, you know, sometimes you do need to defend. Um, and it's it's about how, how we can get up the pitch as quickly as possible sometimes to try and hit teams before they've managed to settle back into their defensive line. And I think Taylor's a big part of that. Um, and she's been playing really well this season. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so, second player I'm going to feature, uh, Neil's already mentioned, Mrs. Person, is, Ke- is Kerry Holland. Uh, Kerry Holland, who joined us in last January uh, from the University of Kansas. So, you know, interesting journey, you know, to leave the uh, Man City Academy and go to America. You know, it's, it's a different style of football. So, it already shows someone who's, you know, willing to do the big moves um, to help their career. I uh, had the pleasure of interviewing her a, a few months back. A bubbly personality. Probably came into us as an attacking mid Neil. I think in her, her first season, she was three goals and seven. Uh, but she's now showing all of her qualities, like a real all-round midfielder. And this new new formation is sort of showing all that. She probably has to curb her attacking ways a little bit. but A, a tiny bit, but I don't, think it's, I don't think she has to sort of massively. I think it's more the idea of what this shape offers Liverpool with the idea of moving the ball forward quickly is therefore a lot of players then backing it up. So you end up in a situation where if the ball, if things don't go to plan, if you shift it forward quickly towards the front three, you've then got another line of four looking to pick up the bits. And that's the two wing backs. And then the two midfielders sort of arriving into that space. And I think that's what Liverpool have done really well. And I think it's what you've seen Kerry Holland be a massive part of too. And then when the play then settles down, if Liverpool have got it in the opponent's half, then you can take turns joining, uh, whether that's in wide areas or whether or not that's in the penalty area. And that's what I think they've done really, really well. I think that that's, you know, in many ways, it's the 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 idea of being able to back one another up and not sort of play as a little bit of a broken team, I think, has really helped this Liverpool side. And Kerry's a, a good, good example of that within there. Again, not least because she can do a little bit of everything. She can beat a player on the outside. She can come inside. She's got pace. She's clearly got a goal score and instinct. And also she can do the, the graph that you need to do in the middle of the park. I think she's playing ever so well. Uh, and I think that she's going to be and remain being in this run of games that we've got coming up now, you know, an integral part of this Liverpool side, certainly for these big league games that we're about to have. I think that her energy combined with her technique means that she's difficult to live with at this level at the moment. And that's what that's what Liverpool are, are prospering from. If you're first to everything and you've got a very good touch, then you're gonna be in you're gonna be in good shape. And and Liverpool, I think, have got that across the pitch. But as I say, I do think it is epitomized first and foremost by Kerry. Yeah, totally agree. Uh so Emma, I mean she is now like probably She's probably first name in team sheet in terms of centre mid, which you know hasn't always been the case. It, you know, it, probably last year it, it was probably like uh, Rachel Finesse who's probably you know the main starter, which we haven't seen as much this yeah. year. So it, it shows her quality that you know someone like a Rachel Finesse is having to be not starting every week because you, you can't drop her at the moment. Yeah, well, as as Neil as Neil spoke about a lot, the I think the energy is is the key word, but also when you when you look at the championship as a whole. Um, most teams aren't as fit as Liverpool. Um, and that might be down to the fact that some some are part-time. Um, but also just the fact that, that a lot of the Liverpool players have come from a WSL background, so they just are fitter. So by having a player who can play a full 90 in that box-to-box midfield role, um, 
as you know, as Neil said earlier, just really, really wears down teams. And I think that's so valuable. Uh, Rachel Furness is obviously a quality player, but um, can she play 90 minutes consistently week in, week out? Probably not anymore. Um, so I think I think that's where we get the best out of out of Furness actually when she comes off the bench these days because she can, you know, provide that quality and come on with that kind of late burst of energy after Ka- Kerry sort of you know done all the hard work and essentially worn the, worn the opposition down as such. But yeah, I think the fact that we have got that squad depth is is really important. You know, you mentioned it earlier, Chris, in the show that when you look back at, at, at the transfer window, I don't think we brought in any any big names as such. You know, a lot of a lot of Liverpool fans um, could have been excused for sort of asking, you know, who who a lot of the players were. Um, they came from kind of, you know, the, the Bristol cities, um, kind of, you know, the bottom half of the WSL. I think Meg Campbell was probably the biggest name, really, coming from Man City. Uh, obviously, she's been out injured and we, we've, we've not seen her. So, um, but what, what Matt Beard did do was bring in um, a squad of players who were all of um, good quality, good standard, who could compete for places. And it wasn't necessarily one or two superstars that, that were going to change the team. It was to get a really competitive squad and to make the most of this depth. And we've seen that highlighted in midfield. We've seen it highlighted in defence. And we're starting to see it up front now as well with the likes of Leanne Kernan and Rihanna Dean um, like either playing together or, or challenging each other for a spot. So, yeah, I think it's really good to have have those options. And Kerry has certainly um, yeah provided that in midfield. I think the most important thing on the, the squad depth point is... Let's acknowledge that Liverpool's functioning player squad budget will be bigger than everybody else in the yeah, championships. Absolutely. And having the five subs and having the ability to be able to make your changes, it isn't just the idea because what we, you know, when you're talking there about Kerry Holland wears them out and then Rachel Furness is able to come on, as Emma says, she's absolutely right. But another thing that Kerry Holland can do by wearing them out is make a manager make a substitution. But the, re- the opp- opposing manager make a substitution. But realistically, the opposing manager is bringing on a weaker footballer as and when as and when he or she makes that change. Whereas Liverpool aren't. They're bringing on a different footballer, but not necessarily a weaker one, right the way across the pitch. And I think that that gives Matt being first and foremost huge tactical agency. But secondly, it just gives Liverpool a really obvious advantage. And what was what's been frustrating is not seeing Liverpool not seeing Liverpool see these natural advantages that they have not that money is a natural thing if you see what i mean but in a football and sense it is they've got this thing that other sides haven't got and they're able to have 20 players quite a tight squad but 20 players of relatively similar similar ability now if liverpool progress into the wsl having these 20 players of relatively similar ability might actually become a little bit of a problem in that they may well be the sort of footballers who might find themselves caught a little bit between the two stools of the championship and the wsl which we see a lot uh, in the men's game when sides get promoted but that's next Next year's problem. This year's reality is Liverpool have probably got a squad where of the if you were to rank the the, the 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 sides with the substitutes and rank the qualities of the footballers, the top 20 of any of these given sides, 14, 15 of them might actually be when these sides meet up, might actually be Liverpool players. So if you're in a position where not only have you got a stronger 11, but each and every one of your subs versus each and every one of their subs will lead to you being markedly stronger than them again because they are playing their 11 best players, then you're going to be in really, really good shape. And I think that that's the other thing that this shift of formation has done for Matt Beard is it even it further intensifies that advantage that Liverpool have got and he's able to change it game by game. And I think that that's a really, really good thing for the club. And, and, and they've, got to, they've got to have that hit home in this next quite intense run of games where Liverpool will be better are equipped to deal with this than a lot of the sides that they're coming up against. Totally yeah. agree. And uh, last player we've got uh, to, to feature, we've already mentioned that, uh, but you can't not mention uh, the player at the moment, which is uh, Leanne Kiernan. Again, another young player, 22, um, signed from uh, West Ham. So Matt Beard obviously knows her very well. And she just looks uh, more and more confident as each game goes by, Philippa. And uh, big goals for us. I mean, the WSL, the one against their villain in the Conte Cup was a, a huge goal because that's kind of what you want, wanted to see. She's now becoming the go-to forward, which is what we've wanted. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we said in, in the last show, you know, how hard working that she is um, and that hasn't disappeared, but she's obviously ended, uh, added that end product to a game as well now. Um, you know, confident players um, is always a good thing. And uh, she's absolutely 
you know, full of confidence at the minute. Um, I'm not too sure what the injury was that she went off with against Aston Villa, but I'm hoping that uh, it wasn't anything too serious and that, that she'll be there at the weekend because, um, you know, you want your players in form and she clearly is in form at the moment. Um, you know, she's used to working with Matt Bird. Uh, she was with him at West Ham. Um, so she obviously knew what Matt wanted from her. Um, um, maybe it was just getting used to the players settling into the side at the, at the you know at the first few games of the season, and now she's done that. She's really found her feet um, and scoring the goals, and you know that are winning us games. So so hopefully uh, hopefully she'll be she'll be there on on Sunday banging the goals in a, again against Lewis for us. Yeah, we hope so. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose the thing is Emma, um, not that you wish an injury on a player, but the injury to Rihanna Dean has actually in some ways gave her more of a, a natural purpose because she's a bit more central now than she was before. Right. Before that, she was filling in out wide, which, don't get me wrong, she can she can play out wide and cut inside, but she has seemed to have taken on that central role as the, as the, as the main person um, a lot more. I think that's probably suited her. Yeah, and all forward players want to be scoring goals. And when you get in, into a position uh, centrally, um, you're more likely to score goals. So obviously, when, with Rihanna being out, it's given Leanne that kind of opportunity to, to get a run of games together where she can be a goal threat and get get that kind of uh, feeling of of scoring consistently under her belt, and and that'll only be that'll only you know be good for Liverpool when when Rihanna comes back because like I said before there's there's now competition for that central place if if Matt wants to play with one up top if he wants to play uh, three across um, across the front obviously with two wide players Rihanna's shown that she can play as a wide player but she's also you know extremely effective in the central role so. It, it, it's it's options and and it all comes back to this squad depth thing again. You know, it's just so good to have options. And I actually can't remember the last time that we spoke about um, a Liverpool women's team that had real squad depth. So um, that's just something that, that for me has probably been the biggest takeaway um, throughout the whole season is just to have that ability to, to interchange. And yeah, since Leanne's come in and, and played that central role, I think she's really, yeah, she's really taken it upon herself. She's, she's more direct with her runs. Um, she's more confident in front of goal now. She, I think she actually embraces uh, the responsibility of kind of being that person that um, that is the go-to in terms of supplying goals. And and we've seen Rihanna do the same. So long may it continue. Excellent, excellent. So let's go to the main part of the show because this is the bit we, we all want to talk about, which is what's coming next. As much as we love to talk about the past, we all want to look to the future. Uh, and this we've got a, an interesting month coming up. We've got six games in 21 days. So... We'll, this is where we will see what squad depth can do. Uh, and I think this is probably the, not make or break, but probably the most crucial part of the season. Um, so, I mean, starts Halloween, uh, Lewis at, at home, for people who don't know Lewis, uh, that they're not sort of so, they're not associated with any sort of uh, men's team. It is its, its, its own own club. Uh, they've just come off the back of a, a 2 0 victory over, over Bristol City. So, you know, this is going to be a tough game. Um, there is still the free coach from Anfield to the game, so if you, you want to get to the game, it's there. And for any of the young fans there or older, there is the Halloween Halloween costume as well. Uh, I'm sure Philippa will be getting ready for the Halloween costume. <laughs> what about you, Neil? Have you got your Halloween costume sorted? Absolutely not. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Highlight of the show. <laughs> that makes, that makes two of us. I'm scared enough. I don't, I don't need a Halloween costume. Uh, but yeah, so Philippa, Lewis, how are we feeling about them? And... Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's going to be a tough game. Um, but I think if, you know, we show the, the kind of form that we show before this international break, then, you know, we should have more than enough to, to beat them. Um, I think it's crucial that we, that we win all our home games now to the end of the season. Um, I think it takes a little bit of a pressure off then uh, some of the away games. Um, but, you know, <laughs> we're all greedy. We want to win every single game, don't we? So, uh, yeah. But, I mean, Lewis, I think we struggled last season. I think we I think we drew away at Lewis last season. So, did, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah um, you know, they're a strong side. They're used to playing in the championship. They're a team that, you know, are... are are used to playing together. They've got quite a good, nice knit um, unit down there. Um, you know, they're a very close, like kind of like family club. So, um, you know, that <laughs> they're competitive, and you know, we need to be really up for this on Sunday. And I'm sure that that Matt will make sure that the, the players are, are well up for the game um, and that we're well prepared for it. 
I mean, the thing to say about the the, the away draw last season, uh, from watching it, we were much the better side. And, yeah. And it was one of those one of those issues where we struggled to firstly build a sufficient lead and then secondly hold it over the course of the game. It was a frustrating two points to drop, to be honest with you. The big thing for this one for Liverpool, it is a mu- it's about as close to a must win game as you're going to get. And there's a couple of reasons why. Obviously, with the genuine run of fixtures that are coming, the idea of going up full stop, as Philippa says, winning every game at home from now until the end of the campaign. But whilst we're playing that, Durham are playing London City. So first yep. versus third is happening at the point at which Liverpool is sitting second to play. So Liverpool have just got to uphold their end of this bargain because they're at least they're either going to create a gap with what's behind them or they're going to be able to leapfrog Durham if they get a positive result. And it's so important with this run of games to both set that tone but also to build that scoreboard pressure on Durham. It would be great if Liverpool could be in a situation where when we go to Durham, we can have the attitude of points fine for us and heap the pressure on them to come and bring the game to us. Because what so often happens when we face Durham across the last couple of seasons is that it's been this idea that there's an expectation, A, that Liverpool should beat Durham, and B, that Liverpool need to beat Durham. And Durham have been able to, I think, prosper from that. So if, if Liverpool could, you know, if London City can do us a favour and then Liverpool uphold their end of the bargain, win the next home game and then go to Durham with the mentality of, it's all right this, if we, if we all draw. If we all draw and we all shake hands and we all walk away with a perpetuation of the status quo, we're happy with that. I think that creates a completely different game dynamic. So the lose game, for me, it's hugely significant and it is it is deadly serious, I think. Uh, not to say that people shouldn't enjoy it and shouldn't wear the Halloween costumes, <laughs> but it's it's a massive, massive three points if Liverpool can notch it. Uh, and I think that from there, then, it does set up all of this other run, but also what it could also do is put massive pressure on the, other, the rest of the top end of the division. It's, it's also off the back of an international break. And I think it's really important to regain that winning momentum that Liverpool mm. had going into the international break. And as, as you said, Neil, when you're looking at, at the next five games coming up after that, including the, the, the Conti Cup game against Sheffield United, which I think is away as well, isn't it? Um, you know, you've I think just setting that tone in that first game is so important because they they kind of left on international break on such a high. Uh, and if you return and you know and you don't quite get that that winning feeling straight back. Um, it might take a bit of time. So, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think I think the Lewis game is really important. I think the other part of it as well is is being patient within it. Their, their games haven't had that many goals in, uh, and that's the yeah. thing that they, they appear to be quite good at, is smothering games to an extent. So I think that Liverpool will need to be patient. Everyone at Prenton Park will need to be patient. But any victory, any victory whatsoever, just will, 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 it will make a difference to the... There's some weekends in all football where there's a, there's a weekend where the table will have a difference made to it by the end of it. And this one coming up is definitely one of them. And I think if Liverpool... You know, you'll be able to see some... If Liverpool win, you'll be able to see something markedly different on that league table by the end of this... By the end of this run, again, this, this one game, the table will look markedly different one way or another from Liverpool's point of view if they win uh, all of it will be positive but there's there's different forms of positive within there it's a massive game on Sunday it really is yeah so we want to get as many there as we can so I mean if you haven't got your ticket yet if you're if you're a season ticket holder or you're a fan card holder you get in for free you just need to basically book your ticket um, if you're not you're talking £6 for adult £4 for children or concessions so you know come and join us you know meet you can meet all of us in the Clippers. Uh, when we're normally there a lot earlier, aren't we, Neil? So you know we can also we're happy there. And just go, even if you don't come, come on your own. You know we've we've done this a few times, haven't we? We've just said to people, yeah. just come and join us. Yeah, the, the one thing I just say on that is that it's a midday kickoff. Yeah. So you know, there's not there's not much clipper time beforehand. I've got a show at ten, so I'm gonna be I'm gonna be legging it over from there. Uh, it's a midday kickoff, which you know doesn't allow, yeah. I just said it's a four pint minimum. But we haven't got time for that, so we're gonna to have to make the best of it. Uh we're gonna to have to make the best of it. But it's a it's a midday kickoff. But yeah, we'll be we'll we'll also be there afterwards as well if people want to come and say hello. Cool, cool. So then Emma, you know, moving on, you've already mentioned we've got Conti Cup, which is away at Sheffield. So probably on paper, probably before it starts in, that would look quite daunting. But having how they performed in the league game, that that is gonna give us some confidence. There is always a bit of a spice to the Sheffield game because of the players. That are now there, and obviously the ex-managers there. But are we think we'll probably think it's going to be probably similar to the Villa game. You would probably expect four or five changes. My only concern is the one player we've never rested yet this year is Mel Lawley. And I'm not saying you have to, but I can't imagine he's going to play every game. And I'm I'm, I'm intrigued to know how Liverpool will do if Mel Mo- Mel Lawley's not starting for us. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, th- I think there will be changes again because um, you know as we just discussed. 
this this kind of run of, of league fixtures um, is really important. Um, the good thing is, with no disrespect, but Blackburn at home is the game after Sheffield, the, the, the game immediately after Sheffield. And that's probably one of the, the, the games that you probably would have liked after a cup game. Um, just because Blackburn probably aren't at, at the same level as the likes of Sheffield, Durham and Lewis. Um, so I think that that gives a bit more leeway. It means that you can maybe go a little bit stronger in the cup um, because hopefully, you know, you, you can start you can start a fairly strong team against Blackburn and, and get the job done quite early and maybe take players off after an hour if, if all goes well. Um, that's speaking as a, as a very, very confident uh, fan here. But yeah, no, I think I, I think there's that. There will be scope to rotate. Um, quite interesting. And I know we spoke about this in the last show, but um, I'm really, really intrigued to see how Liverpool can do in the Conti Cup this season. Um, usually, and I think I've made it quite clear, um, probably shouldn't say that's given my job, but I, d- I just don't really have much time for the for the domestic cups. But um, I, th- I think Liverpool going, going on, a, on a decent run this season will actually be really beneficial for, for them in the league as well. And, and as Philippa mentioned earlier in the show, in terms of going up into the WSL, um, you know, sort of getting used to playing those those kind of level of, of opposition. But I think picking up two points against Villa has actually really helped because it means that they can maybe rotate a bit more in in, in the other games and hopefully still get a win. You know, we've just spoken about the, the the squad depth. So if if the rotation means you know leaving Kerry and and Bo out of midfield and bringing in Jay Bailey and Carla Humphrey, it's that's that's not that's not a drop off really. And if you're bringing out Mel Lawley and I don't know, let's say Rihanna Dean is back from injury and you're putting Jan Kinnan out wide, that's not a drop-off. So um, that's the luxury that Liverpool have. Um, they need to use it. And um, I expect rotation in that game as well. But I, I'd like us to still go quite strong because if we can come out of, you know, the Villa and Sheffield United Conti Cup games with five points, um, then that puts Liverpool in a really, really good position to, to progress on the group. It does, and then it leads on to Blackburn. Now, on paper, Blackburn has signed that you would expect Liverpool to be at three points, but as we saw last year, Philippa, um, Blackburn did very well at frustrating us last year. I think we we drew uh, 0-0 at their place. I mean, basically, a game Liverpool did everything they could to not win a game. Yeah, uh, we really struggled against Blackburn last season, um, and I think this came back to, I think we played them at the time when, when our confidence was particularly damaged. Um you know, I think we knew at that point that we probably weren't going to get promoted. Um, so some of the, I would say some of the fight had gone out of the players a little bit as well. Um, and it's it's always difficult because, you know, these sides, we, we keep saying it, but these sides, you know, playing against a team like Liverpool, it's always a, you know, a, something for them to fight for. You know, they're playing against, you know, this team that's won two WSL titles um, and they see it as a scalp every time they play us so you know every single team is up for games against us um, and we need to be ready to fight in that game as well I do agree that you know on paper it's one that we should be should be winning quite comfortably but as we've seen before in this league you know we can't take anything for granted and you know we have to have to make sure that we're we're up and raring to go for that game um, and that includes the fans as well getting down there and, and supporting them on on at Prenton Park, basically. So, yeah. Cool. And then the big one, which is Sunday the 14th of November, Durham away. So, you know, this is probably the one we all, we've all had earmarked for a little while is Durham are one of the sides you've, you've got to compete with. Durham are horrible sides to play. And I mean that in, and I mean that in a respect form is you don't get any easy game against Durham. We found that first game of last season, got a draw, you know, and then the away game was really hard. So, um, this game's live on the FA Player, so you, you know if you can't get to the game, you know, you can watch it. So, Neil, you look forward to the Durham game. I think it's absolutely massive, but I think Liverpool got to do the job in the other ones leading up to it. Yeah. There's a week before this for both sides, but I think in general on this little run, Durham's is a teeny bit tougher. Um, in the Conti Cup, for instance, they've got Man City. So, you know, it's worth pointing that out that they've got to deal with that one. They've got to go away to Crystal Palace as well uh, at the time when Liverpool are dealing with uh, Blackburn at home. And I'd rather have Liverpool's run of fixtures in general there across those three. I've already mentioned London City. So there's a chance that if Liverpool go there and win, it could by that point be the sort of win that opens up a gap. And that's what we'd be looking for. I would argue for two seasons or for a season and a half, the idea of a gap. But the flip side is I think the most important thing will be just do not lose that game. 
And I think if Liverpool can go into it in a position where not losing that game, as I said before, perpetuates Liverpool remaining at the top or level on points with Durham, then that's going to be perfectly acceptable at that point. But it'll actually help Liverpool win. Uh, I think it's it's it, you know it, it, if Liverpool are ahead of Durham by that point, it becomes an even bigger game for Durham in a number of different senses. Because I think the other thing Durham will feel is that Liverpool will grow through the season and continue to do so. Whereas I think Durham are they are the side that they are, and in the same way that they're the side that they were last season as well. Yes, they've made a couple of changes, but they've got their identity and their way of going about things. I think it's I think it's hugely important, and I think it's one which if if. You know, if we come out the other side of that, if whatever the, the, the situation is the other side of that game, Liverpool are ahead of Durham on top of the table, then I think you are then in a position where you're able to look at Liverpool as genuine heavy favourites to go on for promotion. It's it's never a nice sentence in football, or certainly people don't like it as a nice sentence in football, but if Liverpool get the other side of that Durham game and they are top of the pile, then it is then theirs to lose. And that is, and that is, that that'll be the first time that's genuinely been the case across these the, this, this season and a half we've been in the championship, and that's what's at stake. And at some point, if Liverpool are going to get promoted from this division, there'll be a moment when it's theirs to lose. And almost in a sense, the earlier that is, the better. Whilst people don't like that, a lot of people don't like being a front runner. A lot of people don't like feeling like it's it's in your hands. You've got to carry the delicate vase across the busy room. You know, all of that sort of stuff is something people don't like. But the sooner Liverpool have got hold of that vase, the better, I think. Because I think once they have, they will, they'll, they'll show the quality, they'll show the class. But also, I think there'll be a little bit of other sides beginning to face Liverpool going, well, we're probably not going to get anything from this, but let's just give it a go. Rather than having the attitude of, we can definitely get something from Liverpool because they're vulnerable. And the sooner Liverpool look less vulnerable, the better. And I think if they can come out the other side of that Durham game looking like, looking like champions elect, whatever that may be, even if it's just by a point, then I think that they'll be in really, really strong shape for the second half of the campaign. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, I mean, are you, are you of the same view? If if Liverpool get themselves in front, uh, it's, I think it'll suit them. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I've said this before. Actually, and I, I just think um, the identity of Liverpool as a football club. Um, they are the giants in the league. They're the team that everyone wants to beat. Um, so why not put themselves in that position? Be the team to beat. Be the team to chase. Yeah. Because. I think, you know, they've obviously got the quality. Um, they've got the best squad in the league. I don't think anyone can deny that. They've got the fittest players, um, or they're certainly getting to that point where, where they've got the fittest players. So um, hopefully, just by being top of the pile, it will give them the confidence to go and show all of those all of those qualities. So, yeah, um, for me, I think when, when they get there, and as Neil said, if, if there's a bit of a gap, however big that gap may be, I can only see Liverpool growing from that, really. Definitely. I mean... Following on from Durham, we've got another Conti Cup game. It's home game again, and this time it's with uh, Blackburn. So, again, that's probably a good game where we can rotate, especially if we've got a positive result against Sheffield United. And then the final game we've got in November, which is 20 November, is Sunderland away. Uh, so, so, I think when I started following the women properly, which was probably about four or five years ago, Sunderland and Liverpool were both WSL sides, and games against Sunderland were always great games. Uh, Sunderland have had a hard journey like, Quite harder than we've had. That uh, they actually got moved from the WSL down to the National League uh, in this league, the way the leagues were reorganised, which is probably a, a podcast in its own because it was a very bizarre, very if if honest, a very wrong thing to do to an established WSL club. Not they weren't the richest club, but you know they were an established club. So I've got I know some of the fans from Sunderland. I'm quite, I'm pleased that they're back in the Championship, and I do think they're going to prove to be quite a thorn in the side because we've already seen this year they've got they've got. Big win so far, Philippa. Yeah, um, I think the the one of those sides that you don't quite know what you're going to get from at the moment. Um, you know, I don't think they really played last season because of uh, COVID and everything. So um, it's difficult to to know. Um, you know, kind of like what their style is, so to speak. But they've they've got some really good results, and I think they've surprised a few teams this season. Um, so again, it, it's one of those games. I mean, obviously, by the time we get to that game, we'll have a bit more of an idea of exactly where they fit in the league. Um, you know, whether or not there will be some sort of competition towards the top, or if they'll be more kind of like mid-table. Um, but you know, they're, they're a well-established club, and I think that uh, I don't think that will be an easy game by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but like Neil said before, you know, if if we get ourselves into the position where where we're at the top of the league. Uh, when we get to that game, um, then I think that'll stand us in good stead. And, and as Neil said, you know, 
teams might then be coming to Prenton Park or when we're facing these sides and, and be questioning whether or not you know they can get anything from that game um, or whether or not they focus on other games instead and I think that's that's something that we didn't get to any point of last season um, every single side that we came up against felt that they could get something out of us and uh, that's something that we need to try and rectify this season for me. Definitely and then because the quirks of women's football um, after having six games in 21 days we then have a gap of 25 days before before we play again, which, you know, we'll have probably done two shows before that's finished, to be honest. So I know there is an international break in there, but it, it's such a frustrating quirk of, of women's football is it's rammed everything really hard into a three-week period. And then you see that these massive gaps where all sort of momentum gets lost. And I, not only for teams, but also for fans. If you're, if you're trying to grow the women's game, you need to try and keep the momentum going. Uh, yeah, I, I do completely agree with that. But what I would say is that the momentum that we actually get from the 31st until the 20th is perfect. You know what I mean? This is what we want. And I think it also, it suits Liverpool anyway, I think because of the stronger squad question, but I actually, in, in against the league rivals, but I actually think let's not, you know, whilst the whilst the long gap is hugely frustrating, the flip side is it's great to actually have a run of women's games where there's a lot riding on all of them, where there's mm. six games in 20 days, you know, and I'm I'm really looking forward to this little run. I'm hoping, uh, you know, looking through it, I'm hoping to get to the games uh, against Lewes, um, against Blackburn and against Durham in that run. Um, and that's you know that's a good place to be, I would argue, and and that's you know hopefully if they can if they can do the business through that, then we'll all come out of it absolutely bouncing. Uh, the other thing to sort of point out within there as well is is that there's then because of the nature of the gap, there's then only two games in that December run, and they almost become their own little challenge for Liverpool in there. But it's also why this game, I would say, this run. You know, the other thing to point out is the end of it. We're on nine games played, and they're only playing twenty two in total. So that it is, it's 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 around the halfway point uh, for the season, and it's why this run is more than any will prove to be. I would argue, you know, I know it can ratchet up with some FA Cup games in the second half of the season, but more than any can argue, if if you're Matt Beard, there's maybe a little potential run in March, but you're looking at this as being your season to find and run of games. And if Liverpool keep the momentum up, and that's why it's why the first one on Sunday is so significant. If Liverpool get the momentum back quick and keep the momentum up, then it can it can be season defining in a hugely positive sense. There's also potentially a long time for Liverpool to be top of the table if they come out of this run yeah. top of the table. And you know, and let's say you know they're still top after those two games in December. That's a very very long time for Liverpool to get used to being top of the table. And I think what that does for, for the mentality going into the new year is massive. So I actually think if, if we come out of this run um, in, in a positive way, then then it can be really, really good, that that break, just to have that kind of mental advantage of being sat at the table for, for a very long time. Cool. So Emma, four league games coming up. If, off your 10 points out of 12, are you taking it? Yeah, because I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to... to to drop points to get to Sheffield United if it means that we uh yeah if it means we, we we get we get the full points in the league um but yeah I would I'd as Neil said before I think a draw away to Durham is fine as long as you don't lose that but um absolutely have to be winning the other games for me totally agree totally agree cool so um any sort any other sort of business you want to bring up uh Emma believes the uh there's the draw for the uh, the women's Euros which is in England next year uh England are in the same group as Northern Ireland I believe yeah, Northern Ireland, Austria and Norway. Um, so I think on paper, it's um, a nice group for England in terms of um, the teams that they've managed to avoid. They've managed to avoid the likes of Spain and Sweden in pot two. Um, I think that there's there's a group of death, I think, with Germany, Denmark. Uh, I can't remember the other two. Um, but yeah, Italy, maybe. Um, and there's, yeah, so I think uh, the fact that England and Northern Ireland get to play each other um, I know Fernie was was really excited by that draw. So, um, yeah, I, I I can't wait. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely buzzing. Yeah, I saw I was following the draw yesterday on my phone. So, um, yeah, just really excited now for the for the summer. To be honest. Yeah, it's it's nice to have an international tournament in uh, in England again, uh, yeah. and you can still get tickets. I think there's quite a few around the northwest. There's a a few sort of uh, Yorkshire Midlands way, and then we've got ones in like Southampton and uh, Wembley as well. So. Look, yeah. it's another way of getting to see international football and there'll be some brilliant players you get to see, uh, not just from England, you get to see the Dutch as well. So there's, there's lots of quality coming around in the women's game as well. Uh, Neil, anything you want to, anything else you want to bring up? 
No, I just think in general that people can make any one of these the, this little run of games. I think it'll be worth doing, and I think it's it's a it is the time to support this team. As I said, this is this is the run of games uh, that that you know if they can if they can find the way to put the hammer down, then it will be absolutely brilliant. And I think that you know it's 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 the pathway uh, back to the WSL while simultaneously acknowledging that when we get there, it will be hard, but already showing against Aston Villa that they can compete to an extent with the WSL side is good. And I, I agree with them what Emma said before as well. It'd be nice to see the Conti Cup progress and two wins also in this little run in the Conti Cup will make a massive difference too. Cool, cool. Uh, so from us at the Trippers, um, we are going to obviously continue to do some more uh, women's shows. Uh, I'm hopefully going to try and get some more interviews. I need to start ringing the club and hassling them again. I'm sure they're, they're sick of hearing from me. Uh, but then the important one, which I mentioned every show, is uh, Sienna Steps. So uh, she is now 4,000 4, yeah, 4, short of a target of 120K. So she's flying out to America later on this month for her treatment. So if you can, give what you can. With, uh, if we get, get, get the extra 4K or get it even over, it just makes it a bit easier for the family while they go over to America, get her a treatment, and then for her physio afterwards. But, you know, look, Everyone who supports that, you know, thanks very much. But uh, once again, thank you to Neil, thank you to Emma, and thank you to Philippa for joining us. Uh, this has been the uh, women's show, and we will back to you short. We will back to you. Hopefully, next time, Liverpool will be top of the league. Mm-hmm.